So we've been thinking at, uh, about the home for a long time, but more recently we've been focused uh, on the city and mobility systems and shared use facilities and housing and sensing and technology. So I'm going to give you a little overview of our, the work of our lab, my lab, at the MIT Media Lab. We start by looking at problems. Uh, <coughs> this kind of started it all, I think. This is uh, Los Angeles. It's the ultimate um, city designed for machines rather than people. It's designed to accommodate the car. Uh, and you find this model all over the world. You find it in uh, China, for example, Latin America. This is tower sprawl, but it's a, it, exactly the same model, uh, moving away from the scale of, of the human. I spent a lot of time in China. I, I, I've been to China seven times in the last 18 months. And uh, this was the last time I was there. It was a clear day in Beijing. Uh, but the pollution was, was deadly. The traffic congestion was equally bad. This is, uh, I took this out the window of my taxi cab in Beijing. The poor people, by the way, are zipping along in their bicycles. and. Uh, the wealthy middle class people are stalled in traffic. This is a good day because there's no red there. That's all green and yellow. Um, you find. Oh, this stopped working. You find uh, cities designed, again, for machines. This is a. A traffic circle. We're having problems with this. Do you have it? Do you have your own? Yes. Okay. It's okay. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. So this is uh, this is Boston, where where I live. This is where uh, they cut a highway through in the 1950s, destroying a major part of the city to accommodate, again, machines rather than people. This is Houston. Everything in red is a parking lot or a parking deck. Imagine if all of that uh, underutilized land was put to uses for people. In China, they're building what I think of as new ghettos. They're these single-purpose uh, <coughs> areas. They, have, they put housing here, commercial here, hospital district here totally reliant on the automobile with a very low quality of life. Again, cities more accommodating cars than people. So we've been thinking about a whole series of urban interventions that hopefully will increase the livability of cities and simultaneously reduce resource consumption. So the first concept is going back in time to settlement patterns before machines. Uh, we think of uh, cities should be made up of neighborhoods. We think of them as micro cities, very com compact uh, urban cells where most of what most people need in life can be found within a 10 or 15 minute walk. And I love maps, so I, I have been collecting maps of uh, medieval cities. And this is one of the most perfect. You can see it's higher density in the center, there's a public space, there's some food production within the wall. Uh, the <coughs> outside of the wall is, is more food production, uh, really a, a more of an a, a autonomous uh, village uh, than, than we typically find today. And you find hundreds of these examples. Uh, and they're almost all about one kilometer uh, in circumference. Uh, and it's an interesting model to look at. So we've been We've been looking backwards and looking forwards at the same time. We've been developing new tools to model these communities, and we're, we're using toys. We're using Lego bricks because we find that's a very efficient way and non-threatening way for people to work through cities. Uh, in this case, we're, we're building with color-coded uh, Lego bricks. For example, yellow maybe retail and black housing. Uh, we, we're now looking at using projection mapping to project information onto these models. We're uh, scanning the models as we change them so we can update the computational model that's mated with the physical model and then <coughs> run all kinds of simulation 
projecting back onto the Legos. Uh, it's so we think of, we think of uh, this little Lego brick as a data unit. So we can map all kinds of information to that unit. It may be 10 meters by 10 meters by one story high, the scale we normally work at. We can map construction cost and revenue or occupancy, et cetera, to that data unit. And you may find, um, for example, that this little yellow brick up here can accommodate um, 300 customers per day if it's a Starbucks or two workers. Uh, uh <coughs> at the scale we're working with, that may be a housing tower, 20 meters by 10 meters by 15 stories, that, that accommodates 60 people. And we've been able to work on uh, uh, city designs. This is a, a new city in, in uh, Nansha between Hong Kong and Guangzhou that we worked on where we rapidly developed a series of parties. And as we're building the city, we can, uh, we build a data set and, uh, and, <coughs> and then can analyze that. So what we've now been doing is building a platform to extract this data and to analyze it in a more systematic way. This is the model that we've been thinking about. How many of you saw this movie, Avatar? Right? It's a, now, what's interesting about this for me is that people are standing around a table and they're discussing complex three-dimensional information and they're making decisions about uh, ways of killing people. But we think you can actually do the same thing with urban planning. So we are building rapidly these uh, Lego models. We're using an array of projectors where we scan the model. We have a computational model that's mated with the physical model. We run simulations, we create views that are then projected back onto the physical model, and we can rapidly um, iterate. We can make changes and, and update the simulation in real time. We think this is really critical because uh, I don't believe in virtual reality for decision making and, and many of the other tools. I think it needs to be a co-creation process where people stand around a common view of information look at different layers of information and, um, and make informed decisions. Okay, <coughs> that works really well if you're doing one design, but what if you're doing 50 designs? You're working on multiple cities. So this is an experiment where we have a transformable model with little pins and actuators that can go up and down. And so in real time, we can look at how a city would be phased over time, or we can look at uh, a design for Hong Kong and Guangzhou the same day. Uh, and we can then use the same kind of 3D projection mapping to project all kinds of simulations and visualizations onto that model. We're also very interested in things like walkability. So this is a little uh, study related to our CityScope project where we're working with red tiles that are places of living blue tiles that are places of work. And we can rapidly prototype a design for a new community. We typically work in a one square kilometer area. And then we can tweak all those values. We can tweak the mix. We can, we can uh, dial in a factor for how far someone on average will walk in a particular culture. In Los Angeles, people don't walk very far. In Helsinki, they walk farther. And then we can, we can score the walkability of a place. We did this because we had a developer building a new city in Australia come to us and say, we've designed this walkable city. We didn't believe them. So we built this tool with an algorithm to prove to them that their design actually wasn't walkable at all. And uh, these, these are the, the kinds of tools that we're looking at. We think all of these things we can do over time. The easy things are looking at movement of people and movement of vehicles, we can build agent-based models to look at that. The harder things, though, are looking at livability, productivity, predicting crime, predicting creative output. But th we think we can probably get there within a year or so. So that's, that's the first intervention. It's really looking at uh, urban planning and, uh, and developing the algorithms so we can have simulations with clear metrics to evaluate. The second we think of as, as uh, mobility on demand. 
So that is creating alternatives to the private automobile that would be more convenient, affordable, and pleasurable, essentially eliminating traffic congestion, particularly in a rapidly urbanizing areas. Uh, <coughs> this was the cover of The Economist magazine a few months ago, talking about the sharing economy. I think this is a huge trend. And in fact, I would predict that in 20 years, it will be difficult to find private automobiles within a high density city because they will all be shared use vehicles. This is our uh, notion of mobility on demand. These are all the various modes, starting in the upper left corner is the most important one, that's walking. And then as you move around, they become increasingly less sustainable. The boxes in red are the vehicles that we've designed in our group. But uh, we think you need to have shared bikes, shared electric bikes, certainly trams and buses that can connect people. We're working on a little folding three-wheel vehicle, the electric robo-scooter and, and, uh, and the city car. I'll talk about a couple of these in a minute. But collectively, they form this ecosystem of shared vehicles that allow you to have the right vehicle at the right time in the right place for the right trip. And if you can put all this together, then uh, no rational person would have a private car in a city. So this is, our, uh, this is our city car. It has four innovations, any one of which would be difficult to get into a conventional car. It has robot wheels, so drive motor, steering, braking, suspension, all in the wheel. It's all drive-by-wire. There's no mechanical linkages. Since you get rid of useless things like transmissions and engines, you can fold the car. When you fold it, it's the length of the width of a conventional car. So you can go nose into a parking space, the front door opens, you step directly out onto the curb. We have um, been having a lot of fun with these new vehicles. This is, uh, this is the folding robo-scooter. It's designed to be integrated into a bike share program. But when you fold it, it, it uh, docks and locks. This is our green wheel project, where you retrofit an existing bicycle with a green wheel that has the drive motor and the wireless com communication and the battery all in that little package. Uh, <coughs> and this is the, new the newest vehicle we're working on, which is a folding three-wheel vehicle. We think of it as democratizing access to bike lanes. So elderly people or disabled people, w women wearing skirts, men in business suits can uh, more easily uh, take advantage of bike lanes. This, by the way, meets the EU regulations for a bike lane vehicle, which requires that you pedal. Uh, so we've been developing different architectures for the transformation, how, uh, how this can fold up to a tiny little package. And um, we're working on uh, our carving mechanisms, so you keep the width of the vehicle very narrow. Uh, this also was the cover of The Economist magazine, and I think this is now where most of our focus will be, because we've largely developed the vehicle architecture. The next, the next step is autonomy. We don't really believe so much in the vision, the Google car vision. That will happen. But we're more interested in bringing these concepts together, which is uh, autonomy, it drives itself, shared use, and electric drive. If you can do that, it actually becomes very powerful. Uh, <coughs> connecting that to real estate, if you can fold a car and autonomously park it and charge it, you can get a five to one ratio. In Boston, it costs about $100,000 to build one indoor underground parking space. So you can get a five to one ratio if you combine these elements. So uh, the savings for the developer per car is way more than the cost of the car just in the construction of the parking deck. And eventually we'll get to this because humans are incredibly dangerous as drivers. I mean, we eventually we need to get them out of the loop. The best guess is that computers are 10 times safer than humans, but of course at that point every car has to be autonomous and that'll take a while. If we have, so if we have um, autonomous vehicles on the street, we're, most, we're, we're particularly interested in how they communicate with humans, pedestrians. So if you're walking in front of a 
car with a driver, you make eye contact with the driver, you know it's safe to go. If there's no driver, the vehicle has to make contact, eye contact with you, in effect. So this is our prototype of a, uh, an, a, an autonomous vehicle with um, vehicle-to-pedestrian communication. Third thing we're working on is uh, urban food production. Uh, this is particularly uh, important in places like China, where something like 20% of their farmland is contaminated by heavy metals. And uh, I run into a lot of people that, will ref that refuse to buy produce in restaurants or the markets because they just don't know uh, the safety of them. We've uh, we just, in the last year, built a what we call our city farm lab. So we're testing advanced hydroponics and aeroponic food production. Uh, we were able to produce in about 20 days enough food to feed the entire media lab for lunch. Uh, and uh, we, we did tissue sampling. There were three times the nutrient level uh, in this lettuce as um, organic lettuce that you'd purchase from Whole Foods, one of our premier markets. So what we're looking at eventually is, is creating these high-tech chambers. They have to be sealed uh, that you can skin buildings with. You, you, you need to control about 27 variables to do this properly. Nobody's ever built this. We are now at the Media Lab building a large facade um, integrated uh, aeroponics system to test the integration of natural light and artificial light and controlling all these variables. So ultimately, Hopefully, we could bring this to scale uh, right in c cities, feeding people um, with produce uh, produced at the point of consumption. Now, this is really important because in a one-story array, we think we can get 100 times the food production of soil-based farming using uh, one-tenth the water, 60% less fertilizer, and uh, significantly less CO2 if you look at the entire supply chain. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about what I was asked to come here to talk about. <laughs> so our work with housing. So I'll spend a little more time on this, on this part of it. So uh, we think of it as living space on demand. Maybe that's a little bit awkward title, but it, it's basically um, developing hyper-efficient micro-apartments that are affordable, fun, and productive, particularly for young people, but we're also looking at uh, seniors at home. I'm gonna take you through a little bit of our journey getting to where we are now. We started uh, with a project that we called Home Genome. It was, uh, it was really based on the notion that you have a wide variety of needs of user profiles who have many different lifestyles they need different types of spaces, different designs to accommodate those needs. And developers uh, weren't really responding in any significant way to that. We took, uh, to begin with, uh, <coughs> a look at what developers were actually building, particularly in the US. This is, a, this is a, uh, an apartment plan in Manhattan that some developers I know uh, plan to build in the near future. The, the, um, they typically have uh, a, one bed, uh, a studio apartment, a one bedroom, and a two bedroom. I would say 90% of the floor plans that are built by developers in the US are essentially this. So we took this one little one bedroom apartment and we said, let's do an experiment. Let's, uh, let's develop a whole bunch of floor plans based on that. Uh, these are just a handful of them, and I'm not going to go through in any details, but we broke it into what we thought of as the genome of the apartment. So just simple things like, is, sorry, is a kitchen uh, open to the dining room or is that closed? Is the kitchen bigger or smaller, et cetera, et cetera. So this is one plan. This is, a, this is another one with a, with a large open loft. So we were able to... Um, tag each of these plans with a, well, as I said, what we think of as a specific genome. Then we, then we uh, <coughs> invited people to participate in a study and we characterized their profile using, uh, this is kind of their fingerprint based on uh, their lifestyle. 
And uh, you can see then, we, we had them evaluate each of these plants. Not evaluate the plant, but at evaluate the attributes of the plan. And then we used a matching algorithm to try to match them and give them a ranked order set of floor plans based on, uh, based on their profile. And so we, uh, you can see the different plans that this guy, this guy liked. This woman has a very different profile, and these are the plans that she liked. It doesn't really matter what the details of them are, uh, <coughs> except to say that we were, I think, quite effectively able to match a solution to a user. And then we analyzed all this data, and what we and we we did it first of all by age. So this, these are increasing ages. 18 to 24, et cetera, male, female. The bigger the red circle, the more they hated the plan. <laughs> the bigger the green circle, the more they liked the plan. And you can see a pretty even distribution over these 20 different solutions. We did that by life situation, single and live alone, et cetera. By the way, the developer plan is right here. So it wasn't actually one of the better rated plans. We did it by activity, whether cooking was important, et cetera, et cetera. So then we said, well, the right way to do it would be some mass customization process. By the way, this all happened 10 years ago. This is when we were doing this. So we said, let's uh, have a furniture customization process where we have components that we array into spatial assemblies, and then we can do a uh, customized apartment. We could build a whole series of these arrays. We could take into account, for example, the needs of elderly people. We could look at all the new technologies or the, you know, the pull-down storage that might be useful for someone in a wheelchair. And basically what we were doing is we were profiling the individual needs. We would profile the solutions, run it through a matching algorithm, very much the same as how Google matches you to advertisements. Then we would give people a ranked order set of solution and then a tool where they could refine it because no algorithm will get it right 100%. And um, this was a little uh, mock-up of the interface that we built where people answer questions, they, they look at images. I don't know why that's not playing. Let's try this again. They, they answer questions, they sort images, that is used to establish their profile. Sorry, if this was playing, you would then see this apartment build up with all these components that are personalized to that individual. I don't think that's the right idea, though, because I think it's way too complicated. And I think the supply chain is too difficult to develop. I think you can do it uh, to a certain extent, but... Um, and companies like IKEA that I met with yesterday maybe could take, develop that supply chain so it would work, but it's a very hard thing to do. So then the next step was we said, let's, let's not try to develop a fixed solution that is matched to people. Let's develop dynamically reconfigurable solutions so people can, when they need it, de uh, develop the, the appropriate configuration. Now, at the same time, Mayors all over the world, like the mayor of Boston, the mayor of New York, were saying, um, we're pricing the young people out of the market in our central cities. And this is a real problem because they're the lifeblood of the city. So let's build tiny little apartments for young people. And of course, a lot of young people say, we don't really want to live in a dumbed down, tiny little conventional apartment. And they, they haven't really worked too well in the marketplace. So we said, let's take this same strategy that we were working on before, where you build open lofts and then you, then you have this infill disentangled from the construction process designed at the point of uh, sale or lease. Uh, but that infill should be dynamically reconfigurable. So this is a video we did, I don't know, three, three or four years ago, where you can see the apartment can dynamically change its configuration to accommodate working. Maybe you have a startup or uh, <coughs> a dinner party or exercise um, uh, or maybe even open up uh, all the way up for uh, <coughs> to have one large space to accommodate a large cocktail party. 
So that was kind of the original concept. So we said, let's try to develop the technology to allow this to happen. Now, we really wanted it to be magical. We didn't want it to be a lot of work. We wanted it to be so cool that when you walked into the apartment with a friend, you would say, watch this, you know, and then you would transform your apartment. So this is our early prototype for the robotic wall with touch sensors and we have motor controllers and just the right acceleration. Uh, when it's fixed, it locks at the ceiling, it gets low voltage power so you can have electronics in it. And I think that actually worked pretty well. So we built a living laboratory to test this. This is one version of this infill, which is a furniture package where you have uh, cabinetry that can move so you can have a walk-in closet or, a, uh, or an office space and then tucked under that is, is the bed. So you have sleeping, working, dressing, clothes storage, uh, entertainment all in this one prefabricated package. It was a little bit clunky, but uh, it, was, it was good enough so we could, we could actually get data about use. And, and what we found was that particularly young people after living there for a while, they'd go back to a conventional apartment and they would say, how come I can't just move that wall out of the way? And so we thought maybe we were onto something. So then we thought um, the bed going underneath has some disabilities issue. It's not wheelchair accessible, the other space. Uh, the Murphy beds people hate because they're too much work. So we thought, well, let's just convert a living space to a sleeping space by having the bed come down. We use very inexpensive uh, garage door opener motors and, uh, and sensing. And I think the cost of automating this is probably less than trying to do it all mechanically with counterweights. So now we're working on that. We've, uh, we, uh, we said, well, we can do the same thing with, with a table. Uh, so in this case, this is actually my graduate student's apartment. <laughs> so he retrofitted his little apartment to convert from a little play area to a dining area. And um, you see the table comes down from the ceiling. You can even have the place setting already, already in place. These are kind of the IKEA, you know, low-end versions. You could have very high-end versions as well. And uh, we're having a lot of fun, you know, experimenting with that. You get the idea. <coughs> so uh, <coughs> the student said, well, okay, that's fine for these things, but what if you want to move furniture out of the way? So this, I just got this video last night. They did this yesterday. <laughs> they developed a robo couch that you move out of the way. So this is, uh, this is in the atrium of, of the media lab. And again, it was maybe $150 worth of hardware. It's not, uh, it's, it's not uh, out of the question to think of having an entire apartment <laughs> that you could effortlessly reconfigure. You know? So those are the kind of graduate students I have. I had no idea they were doing that. So. <laughs> So um, we've, we've now been actually doing some more serious work, working with developers. This is a developer in Manhattan who's building a 36-story tower, all of micro units, and we're helping them. In this case, we have a 313-square-foot apartment. It's one big living room, the smallest kitchen and bathroom that meets the uh, zoning regulations of New York. So actually, it's quite a nice big living room. Uh, except there's nowhere to sleep until the bed comes down, and then you have a king-size bed and a nice big living room, and then the bed goes up and the dining table comes down so you can have a dining party for 10 people, or that can be um, where your, your startup operates during the day and your employees come in. And we're looking at uh, larger apartments. This is our extra-large apartment, which is... 590 square feet, so you have uh, sleeping, living, dining for eight, a study, now you have two bedrooms, and now the whole space opens up. So these three elements, the robo walls, the bed, the table that comes down from the ceiling. This is a, an image showing the daytime use, the study around the corner, the table. At night, the wall comes forward, the door shuts. This is then a view of this relatively small apartment, but with everything opened up. So for a party space, you have a really quite a nice uh, experience. 
you can you can use it for very pragmatic reasons too. In in um, New York City, a kitchen is requires four feet between an island and the counter. But if you are an elderly person using a walker, that's way too wide. You need it to be less so you can grab on on, on both sides. But if you're in a wheelchair, actually you want it wider than the code says typically, like five feet. So this is a very practical reason for using transformation. Of course, you can bring in all, all kinds of new devices. So we're now um, looking at a, uh, well, I challenged the students to try to develop the smallest apartment they could. This is a 17 meter apartment. I don't know, would that be small for Finland? What would be the typical small apartment in Finland, in Helsinki? 25, 25 or 30? Yeah, square, meters. square meters, yeah. Right. So this is not too far off half that size. So uh, what we're working on now is um, this scheme, where we have, a, we have a tiny little bathroom. By the way, the sink is over the toilet. The sink comes forward. The idea is you don't typically use the sink and the toilet at the same time. So why not share that, <laughs> why not share that space? We have, a, we have a little shower there, but there's no way to get to it. So this is the, the kitchen and the storage and the bed. So when you want to take a shower, this whole unit comes forward, and then you have a nice big, uh, relatively big bathroom. Uh, then when you have a dinner party, a table and the bench comes out, so you, you then have um, a nice place to uh, have a meal. Uh, the bed then comes out from this, so, and it tucks under uh, during the day. Uh, the table can come out part way for working. This is only one, one solution that we're working on related to this. But the idea, this is all piece furniture. It just, it just comes in as an inserted inserted it has uh, it can have all kinds of technology integrated into it uh, oh, by the way if you are cooking a meal you can double the counter space with that little panel that hinges down and I think we could build this in a cost-effective way we're actually now building a prototype in our lab at MIT this is a quick little animation that shows how the space configures and this was done before we had resolved a lot of the design issues, but it's more or less what we're talking about. And the technology is pretty simple. It's actually, there's nothing really that, that is technically uh, difficult here. We're just using standard sensors and motors that you can buy, all produced in China with economies of scale, so it's very cheap. The mechatronics are a little complicated, but we have very good mechanical engineers in our group, so we're, we're working all of that out. So these are some of the studies for the different variations of this. You could have a kitchen, not a kitchen. It could be bigger or smaller. It could have more storage, et cetera. So I think that uh, what we've come to is rather than mass customizing the apartment, you want to mass customize the stuff that goes into the apartment. I don't believe in smart homes. I think that's really kind of a dumb idea. <laughs> I think we should build very dumb homes and put smart things in it. And uh, that's much easier. Uh, we've, we've done studies working with shipping containers. I used to hate the idea of working with shipping containers for housing. Now I think with these transformable elements, they can, it can probably work. And uh, we've done some studies now that show that it, it could actually be quite cost effective. Then ultimately you want to bring all this together. So you want to bring living and working and mobility and food together. We did a little workshop not long ago. This was uh, a little study model that this one of the students built, which I quite like because you see it has urban farming here. We have the terraced uh, micro units. We have co-working space. So this is all the shared space that the first speaker talked about. We, in this case, we have a city car dispenser. So this would be a mobility hub. So the cars are folded and they're stored on this, uh, this uh, little carousel. And then these are the shared vehicles that are staged, ready for pickup. Uh, for the developers we're working with, we did this little quick study. We showed that uh, with conventional apartments, if you had 14 apartments, in most places you need 14 parking spaces. In Boston, you need one-to-one. -one. If you 
shrink the size of the apartment in half with the transformation so it functions as if it's twice as big, according to the current zoning, you would then need, you'd have 28 homes, you'd then need 28 parking spaces, but of course, if you then have the folding shared city cars, you can have a fraction of the space devoted to parking. And then on top of that, if you introduce shared use, you, you don't need nearly that many vehicles. By the way, best guess is that shared vehicles have a 15 times the, the uh, utilization rate. In other words, rather than one vehicle serving one person, one vehicle can serve 15 people. Uh, so we've, we've also applied this, this thinking to um, the workplace. This is our uh, transformable office lab. The idea is that you um, would have in your home or in your office uh, this transformable desk. It can go up and down. You have a big display that presents your work to the world. Uh, you can lock it up. You can array it into different team spaces. So you can have, in effect, a team room with these large displays. Uh, in our lab, we're getting rid of all our private offices this summer, and we're going to build these for the students. They don't do their private work here typically, so this is actually more for, uh, for teamwork. We, we really think that all this ultimately needs to be kind of magical. You know, if you're going to shrink a space down to something very tiny, you have to make it really cool, you know, really desirable for people. And we're beginning to think about how we might do this. Uh, we have a project with Siemens where we're use, we, we have a sensor network. This is our lab, uh, one of our labs. We, we're, we're doing activity recognition, so we're recognizing office activity. We're dynamically tuning the light, the LED light. This is then the sensors firing, the, and the activity recognition is being processed in background. And as people then move through the space, the lighting intensity and the color will change. By the way, blue light is about 30% more energy efficient than full spectrum white light. But this is a living lab experiment to do the easy stuff, which is to measure the energy saving, but also the hard stuff, which is more ethnographic surveys of how um, acceptable this kind of transformable environment is to people. Uh, one of my graduate students did something fun with sunlight. Shoot, I wish this video would play. Oh, there it goes. Okay. So we have, she built this little array of shutters and put it up a, at a window where sunlight is coming through. Then she has uh, different tools. You can draw a picture or you can send text and you then get uh, patterns of sunlight and shadow in the space in response to whatever input you want. You can map any kind of input. You can do a little drawing or send a text message, et cetera. And people love, people love this. This is a, um, a project that one of my students did two weeks ago. Uh, it, uh, he took a slot card. You know the slot cards that kids play with in the track? He turned it upside down and uh, mounted a camera and a uh, little Pico projector on it. So you can, anywhere in the space, throw information. You have a camera that does uh, computer vision uh, uh, activity recognition and positioning. So uh, <coughs> you can lie in bed, and the projector comes over and can, pr can project information or an interface uh, right where you are. You can go to your desk. It can pr project down on the desk. You can play games on the coffee table. You can uh, project onto a pillow and control your, your television from the pillow. I don't know that the homes in the future will be filled with giant displays. I mean, they're getting cheap. Um, that's one way to do it, but I think uh, it, it, it may be more interesting to have the, this more dynamic information system, certainly more cost effective in the home. So we're looking at this for uh, very inexpensive student housing. Uh, you might have some remote connection to your mother where she's teaching you how to cook by projecting onto the counter. You know, these ideas have been around for a long time. Maybe you, maybe you have a, you eat dinner with your girlfriend that's who's in a different city. So 
In this case, we have the same sensor network that's recognizing activity. We have an articulating mirror at the facade of the building such that it captures sunlight and throws a beam of sunlight into the space. In this case, she picks up her mobile phone and she positions the sunlight to where she uh, finds the soft interreflected light perfect for working at the kitchen counter. Then she maps that activity to that sunlight location. An algorithm keeps the sun in that position as long as it's up. She can map a different light position to reading a book on the couch. So in effect, you have personal sunlight that follows you around. Um, so living labs. So I know SRV, Tonelli, the interested in living labs. We've, we've long uh, been interested in the topic a living lab can really be many things. This is work that we did, uh, my colleague Sandy, Sandy Pentland, living lab experiment at the scale of the city. Every little dot there is a mobile phone moving in the city. Uh, it's fairly easy to do if you can get the data from the mobile phone companies, but what we did here is we had some profile information and based on pickup and drop off location, we characterized um, people as to a member of a particular nightlife tribe. So this was all nightlife behavior in San Francisco. So it may be young families going to family restaurants or young men going to clubs, et cetera. Then you map that back onto the city. And, and then what we found was this blue tribe tended to buy the same mobile phones. They tended to have the same diseases. They, send, they had many, many things in common. So this is a way of actually uh, getting <coughs> uh, really interesting information just by looking at mobile phone data, just as an example of one way to conduct a, an experiment. We built, uh, gosh, it's been 12 years now, uh, um, what we call the Place Lab. This is often cited as the first highly instrumented living laboratory um, for residential work. We, we actually used uh, our idea of infill with cabinetry, but behind the scenes in the cabinets, we had literally hundreds and hundreds of sensors. We knew where people were, what they were doing, the state of the environment, the objects they interacted with, and then we did a whole series of experiments related to health and energy conservation and communication, et cetera. So I am delighted that uh, there's an interest in building a residential living laboratory here. I'm not sure, living labs mean something very different in Europe than our definition. So I'm not sure if this is what you guys are thinking about, but my definition of it is an instrumented living environment where you can deploy, test, evaluate the interaction of people with design and technology innovation. Is that what you're thinking? Okay, very good. Then we're on the same page. Thank you. Do we have do we have time for some questions? Or? So, yeah, there are some questions in the board there. Uh, somebody was asking how much more do these moving walls cost? Do, did well, you compare hard, the pr Yeah, yeah, price? that's a hard question to, to uh, answer. I'll tell you how we've calculated it. We take, well, say for, let's just use round numbers. Say we have a thousand square foot apartment we think with the moving walls, we can get the functionality of that 1,000 square foot apartment in 500 square feet. In Boston, it's about $1,000 per square foot. So you save $500,000 by shrinking that apartment. Now, we discount by 50% that savings in space. So we, st we, we calculate you save 250000 We are figuring about $10,000 per transformation. So the bed goes up, that's 10,000, et cetera. So in that scenario, if you had a moving bed, a table and a wall, 250 minus 30, the value proposition is 220,000. We, ha we, haven't, we haven't built enough of these in the marketplace to validate those numbers, but I think somewhere in there, even if you assume you saved a quarter of that, there's still a good value proposition. And uh, another question was that when are we going to see all this in life? <laughs> well, we're building them right now. We've, we've started a 
startup company to commercialize this technology. It's an M MIT Media Lab spin-off company. And uh, we will, we, we will, I showed one apartment that actually is functional right now. We, we will have the full set of our ideas uh, in place with people living in them within nine months to a year. Maybe faster if SRV wanted to <laughs> get involved. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.